Is everybody good to go? You need to settle in? All right, so we'll get going. So um, I'm going to be ripping through a bunch of data, a bunch of content. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be making some, a little bit of some jumps, not leaps, but jumps in between how data is connected or some information is connected overall. So if something doesn't make sense to you, please feel free to kind of pop up. We've got a nice controlled audience in here, in here so it's not, um, not going to be chaotic. So uh, if, it, if it's not tracking for you, just let me know, and uh, I'll slow down and kind of try to elaborate a little bit more. So part of the process, all right, so the agenda really, you know, what, what's going to be, you know, what's driving transformation, because this is a transformation conference. Uh, what's that pace of change? What are some of the things that are, that are happening? So I'm going to talk a little bit about what's happening in other states. Predominantly, I'm going to talk about what's happening in Florida and how they're doing some of their transformational work and some of the things that they're kicking into. I'm going to talk about Texas and some of the things that Texas is dealing with right now. Okay, uh, in, in their transformational process. And then I'm going to look at a little bit of private sector and what is private sector doing in the transformational space. Uh, collectively, that rolls up to how is it going to influence here in California? What, what's going to be the step in California where suddenly um, all of these market factors because things move around both from public and private sector into the inflow into California a little bit. So um, let's see. There we go. So I'm going to talk a little bit right now about um, some economics, right? And so this is some data from uh, Pew Charitable Trusts. And if you can take a look at this in here is that we've got Florida, Texas, and California. What you're seeing over here is the uh, change in tax revenue uh, in each uh, state uh, over the last few years. And you can see right now that we've got a trend upward a little bit. Uh, within the context of both uh, California, which really took you know some really uh, weird dips here and there, Texas revenue line comes mostly because of one event. Right when when public folks talk about uh, public leadership talks about what are the things that they deal with the the most in terms of their planning, and, and typically the answer is events, right? Because it's the things that they can't plan for, and that event was fracking. Okay, so suddenly Texas went from uh, an annual spend based on some relative income associated with uh, business within the state of Texas in terms of uh, revenues, you know, general tax revenues from oil and gas companies and other, uh, you know, Dell and other entities that are in Texas, and suddenly you've got a boom in fracking, right? And that fracking started to drive the dollar content, right? So we had one client in Texas who went to the legislature and asked for $35 million to be able to do a modernization project, and the legislature gave them 50. <laughs> they came back, and I'm sitting in a room with them, and they said, we went for 35 and they gave us 50. And they didn't know what to do, <laughs> right? Because it was, it was completely an oddball model. Um, recently, that dip that you see uh, was the fact that fracking kind of stopped. Right? Some of the, the oil prices went down, right? and some of that did. Uh, in California, we can see some of that cyclical up and down. Right? In Florida, the challenge that Florida has is that they don't do Obamacare, they don't do a lot of federal programs, so their revenue is very uh, tourist-centric. Right? And they've got some industry, but it's very tourist-centric in Florida. So if you then take a look at um, the percentage of state revenue, revenue from uh, federal funds as a, per, you know, as, a, as a percentage component. You'll see that California actually, I was very surprised about this data, California actually has a lower uh, uh, percentage of their total uh, revenue from federal funds than, than everywhere else. Um, it's actually uh, lower in terms of the top three states in the nation. Okay. But then if you take a look at the days that each state could run on a reserve, Meaning, let's say that something like kind of stops you know, in terms of revenue for some whatever reason. Okay, let's say that the legislature locks up. You know, this happened a few years ago. Right? The legislature locks up, and, and there's no more funds available. Okay, um, California has a 17-day uh, reserve. Okay, um, Florida's doing a little bit better. They're at about 49 days, 50 days. Uh, Texas has a reserve of 120 days worth of cash in terms of what they can do, right? So kind of here, here's one of those jumps I was talking about a little bit, right? Is the sense that you've got this data, 
in the sense of what, okay, so why in a transformational workshop or a transformational conference, why is he talking about the economics of it all? And the reason I'm talking about it is because that's what's really driving transformation, right? The more the constituency has in terms of expectations of government and how good government is doing in terms of its ability to fund programs directly drives how much transformational expectation there is in government, right? Because there's a big difference in terms of what constituents in Missouri expect of their government against what somebody in Florida expects or somebody in Dallas expects of some, you know, the, the state government in Texas, okay? So that, that's the context. Any questions as I go on? Okay. So going on transfer t uh, transformation. Um, fundamentally, we need to understand the trends go from east to west, all right? So as an example, in, in the last financial crisis, when everything hit rock bottom, it hit rock bottom in the northeast first. It took about nine months for that transition to come all full-blown into California to the point that businesses and government in California were actually impacted by the Great Recession. Right? So that process is, is a continuous historical migration of trends, economic impacts, progressiveness, those kinds of things are happening more from an east to west model. Okay? Um, McKinsey did some analysis they took a look at and said that 44% uh, of large-scale government transformation efforts really meet the targets. The key that they found is that those trans transformational efforts were very aggressive. They were not positioned in this, well, we're going to give it a try and see what we do, right? They're gonna, they put out some very aggressive goals, and by forcing those aggressive goals, they were able to meet a higher success quotient. When, they tried to do an when government tried to do an incremental change, and doing a little bit, they were only 35% of the time were they successful. So incremental change actually has a lower success rate than a much more aggressive change. Right? But when you say aggressive change, it has to, it has to encompass everything. Right? It has to be bought into. It's not this thing that you kind of just piece together. Right? So the data is indicating that in states that are, are really putting out a very demanding change policy, that that tends to be more successful than an incremental change policy. So the five critical elements of sustainable government transformation was a, a study that was uh, funded by a, a, a group out of Florida. Um, and what they came to the conclusion with, and this is in alignment with a lot of, uh, of other uh, folks' positions around it, is that the number one thing is you want to drive large-scale structural change in terms of government. The second element is focusing on the core government mission. Really understand what the focus of the government mission is in the context of that transformation and then look at potentially outsourcing everything else that addresses it rather than trying to own everything. Okay? Um, and we're going to talk about, about this in, on the private sector side. Um, deploying technology effectively is kind of a Captain Obvious point. And then the, the managed procurement and the contracts is a critical point. Again, a little bit more on the obvious piece. Um, but then the thing that really also is affecting is enforcing metrics and in, 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 in that discipline and metrics in that measurement process. So on Florida, um, one of the things that we work with, uh, as a company, we have offices in, in California, uh, in Sacramento, in Austin, and in Tallahassee. And so when I work in Tallahassee, I meet largely with three groups. I meet with the legislature, I meet with the governor's office, and I meet with um, the CIO's office uh, on an active basis. I usually don't meander down into uh, programs uh, or into the, the different departments. And the reason is that uh, part of what we do is mostly focuses on that leadership component, but the other part of it is that Florida, in Florida, the legislature reviews projects and initiatives on an annual basis. So let's say that you go and you put in a BCP and you want to do something over the next five years, right? Typically you get a lot, you get the, a lot of that money, there's some oversight to it, um, but the legislature really doesn't get involved on a deep basis unless something's going wrong, right? And they pull you out and they say, okay, what's going wrong? In Florida, you have to step in front of the legislature on your initiative and defend whether or not it's gone right. And if, and I kind of, call it feeding them uh, a noodle through a straw model, right? 
So they force you to validate the program or the project that you're doing on a year-to-year -year basis. And if it's not going well, they terminate at that point. So they've removed that administrative authority from the departments. They've removed that go, no go, lump sum budgeting element from the departments. And the legislature's taken that ownership back because so many businesses and constituents, and again, Florida is a much more conservative state, so there's some, there's some different things there, right? So you have to incorporate some politics into that. But overall, Florida has a much more micromanagement perspective. Right. So you could say, okay, Florida is a unique case. Right. Texas is very similar, in fact. Right. So there's a group in, in Florida called Florida Tax Watch. They work co collaboratively with uh, the legislature. And they monitor all the bills, everything that's going on. And if they don't like it, they scream like crazy in the papers. And they make a big, big deal about every decision that's made. Right. And that invasiveness from Florida Tax Watch has become much more aggressive in the last six, seven years. Okay. Um, Associated Industries of Florida, they run a full pro-business model. So they're trying to actually push all taxation down as much as possible within the construct of, of Florida to be able to either attract business or be able to facilitate uh, you know, more growth and profitability out of the Florida environment. Okay. Um, in 2005, uh, it was the last time they did it. Well, since 2005, they've done away with the state CIO office twice. They, they not only just fired the state CIO, they got rid of the entire department. Right? The governor came in and said, yeah, it's a waste of, literally, not my words, they were you know, paraphrasing, but it's a waste of money. We're not spending any money on this. And so finally, the legislature kind of put a bill together in 14, and in 15, they just started to reinstitute um, the, the CIO's office again. And it's, it's 25 positions, and it's, it's a policy branch, purely policy branch, okay? Um, their focus is driving consistency and accountability through whatever investments they're making in technology within the state, because they have such a low success rate. A lot of this comes and stems from the fact that a lot of government initiatives have moved forward, but yielded very low, low value in terms of what they've done. Um, so their priorities right now, if you talk to senior, man, you know, senior leaders within the state, is they want to start, they're, they're actually not hiring state employees as much anymore. They're almost fully outsourcing some positions. Um, their focus is really driving more analytics investment. Uh, and they're moving, you know, a lot more investment into the cloud and away from data centers and, and different things like that. Okay. Texas, um, late in 14, early 15, um, Health and Human Services uh, had a bit of a scandal. And the scandal came on uh, the heels of about four significant projects that had failed at uh, a pretty good level uh, statewide, right, in terms of nearly a billion dollars of, of, of uh, value lost out of investments in, in initiatives that they have done. And uh, what they had found is that um, the director of Health and Human Services was sole sourcing projects to a comp an Austin-based company called 21CT uh, that ranged in, uh, right around $100 million in value. And the performance was, uh, again, poor. Uh, and somebody just kind of said, you know, we've got contracts, we've got to have a hold of this and said, we can't do this anymore. The state shut down procurement of all IT for six months. Zero, nothing. Not a staffing position, not a license renewal, nothing for six full months to investigate everything that was going on and to begin to revamp and take a look at it. So they developed um, Senate Bill 20 to really eradicate the whole bad procurement process. Um, the state, you know, again, stopped all of those procurements for six months and now they're starting to come back into the procurement process and the focal areas are security, analytics, and cloud. So they're really looking at how do they migrate out of their current legacy environments and moving it into that, that analytics in, uh, into that cloud environment 
and then how they can apply some of the data and analytics um, as well as, as dealing with security. I'm going to talk about security a little bit in a few minutes um, because that's another huge trend uh, on the private sector side. So private sector transformation. Um, now you're looking at the sort of the state behavior, right? So you've got two of the state number two and state number three, right? Being Texas and Florida in that order. California is number one, just so in case somebody didn't get that. Um, the, the behavior on the private sector side is a little bit different. How many people have iPhones in the room? Right. Um, does anybody remember the last major iOS update? It was, it was number nine. Does anybody remember that? Okay. Number nine came out in September of last year of 15. Does anybody know how many incremental updates that there have been on iOS 9 since September of last year? 15. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Once every couple of weeks. Exactly. Right? And those aren't like bug fixes. Right? Those are enhancements yep. to, to what's going on. Right? So if you really look at the marketplace today, right, there's always the leaders, there's the others. But if you look at the, at, at, at the marketplace, fundamentally, the market has moved into a position on the private sector side that they are driving what's called self-disruption. And the reason that they do this is very straightforward, that the pace of technology and the pace of the leveraging of technology within strategy, technology is part of that, D, that, that strategy DNA today. It used to be a, a glom on part, right? You had the DNA of your strategy for your company. And then you would infuse technology into that because it would give you, an, you would use it as an accelerator. Today, if you talk to most CEOs who are typically financial or business, very, very business focused people, they will, they will acknowledge or talk to you about how virtually every single strategy they have involves some technology component associated to it. So technology is embedded in the DNA of strategy today. It is not an addition to the strategy, okay? And so in that self-disruption process, the reason they need to do it is because they need to put the, push the markets into transition. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means. So what, in the disruption process, they're looking at anticipating what's gonna happen. They wanna capture some of that revenue and they wanna lead the market in that space. Because if they don't, what happens is the company gets into an incremental gain model. And if you're growing incrementally on a year-to-year -year base, you're not meeting the pace that Wall Street is setting for you in that expectation. And if you're not doing that, you're starting to fall off. So what they're doing now is they are reinventing industries every 12 to 18 months, all right? So let's talk about hearing aids. I'm not gonna ask anybody who's got a hearing aid here. But hearing aids, right? Very common thing, very normal thing, okay? just like uh, maybe a dental implant, right? But hearing aids, established, you think it's kind of boring, all that kind of thing. The hearing aid industry, as an example, transferred production of all components of the, the major part that fits in your ear, right? There used to be manufacturing places that would make these things. They went, from 100% from that traditional manufacturing process to 3D printing, right? Everybody's heard about 3D printing? In 500 days. In 500 days, if you were not a 3D printing ear piece, whatever manufacturer, you were out of business. They don't exist today, right? So in late 14, that transition happened. Companies went out of business within less than 500 days because of that transition, all right? There's other examples. You know, Wang didn't make the transfer from microcomputers to PCs, so they went out of business. Lucent didn't believe in VoIP. They bit it, <laughs> right? Cisco, everybody knows Cisco, right? They bought a company called Flip. And I don't know if you ever remember that flip phone or that flip uh, video camera. It looked like a, almost like a brick, like an iPhone thing, right? So they spent a lot of money on that company. Within, <laughs> I love this story. Within two months of the final acquisition of that, iPhone had introduced the fact that it could do video on the iPhone 
that was better than what the flip device could do. Flip was dead and gone within two months. Okay? So what I'm trying to share with you a little bit is the fact that the pace is accelerating. And the pace is accelerating not because some, I don't know, cartoon character or movie character is sitting in an office somewhere in Silicon Valley dreaming up all of this stuff and, and divining it on us. The pace is changing because we, each of us as individuals, have this insatiable consumable process, right? We're getting 15 iPhone I updates within a three month period because we need that change or those values in order for us to stay connected in that context, all right? So now us as individuals working within the context of government, are you gonna leave that thinking at the door? Are you gonna leave those expectations at the door as people who work in government? No. So imagine the people who come and, and have expectations or needs from government. Right? How, many, how many times has anybody encountered a constituent who, does, who isn't connected? <laughs> Right? It's very rare these days. It's not, you know, there are still circumstances, you know, there's a good pop part of the population, but a lot of people have phones that connect them, right? So what a lot of the focus is today is on cloud mobility, but it's really pushing into the space called Internet of Things, all right? Um, Cisco calls it Internet of Everything, so they, they, they came up with their own term. But the Internet of Things talks about some fundamentals, which is that you, know, you, have, you have a medical device that's connected wirelessly to the patient's record system, which is connected automatically to the billing system, which is connected automatically to the Internet, right? So people are doing diagnoses on tablets and walking around, and it's all seamless, right? And so, the, the concept of people process and technology is now beginning to explode and it's not so much people process and technology now it's people process data and devices okay and so the transformational process within the context of private sector is driving this because we are consuming it at a very rabid pace all right and the difficulty is that based on the economics that I shared, shared earlier, uh, right, Pew Charitable Trusts, right, they've done the analysis up in, through 2015, is that that rate of taxation growth pushes transformation demand, and that transformation demand is pushed by private sector behavior, which is fueled by our personal behavior, as well as the fact that you have political pressures coming east to west that are saying the way it was isn't the way that we want it to be anymore. And it's beginning to travel. So the whole procurement reform, the oversight reform, the scrutiny, the elimination of, of offices and reinvention of offices, uh, how things are happening within the context of, of large uh, states is going to influence how California begins to adopt and adapt to the transformational needs based on constituent demand, right? See how it's all starting to roll up into a, into a bit of a ball there? And it's hard to separate that. It's hard to separate this world, right, where you, <clears throat> you live in a space where you're continuously connected to cloud services, right? I mean, as an individual, I can set up my own cloud account, update my iPhone on my own, download apps, install them, learn how to use them, and I never, ever have to call an IT person. Ever. Okay? The transformation is being pushed in, right? And the challenge is how does government respond to that? How do you, how do you deal with that from a fiduciary perspective? It's like, look, we're not in a risk business. We're in a safe, you know, we have the responsibility of tax dollars. We want to use those tax dollars in the most effective way possible. Right? We don't take risks. Right? We do things that are known and solid. Right? And the thing that you start to find is in this environment that government's saying, hey, you know, we have this thing we need to transform, we need to move into this direction. And it's like, okay, we're going to do it this way. 
And then three years later, you pick up your head and say, okay, well, we're ready to go with this thing because we've gone through our approval processes, our funding processes, and all those different things. And suddenly, you're five iterations behind everything that, that's happened, right? I was talking to somebody uh, <coughs> recently who said, our, our technology group has been evaluating Office 365 as to whether or not we're going to go to Office 365 for 18 months. The whole, the whole world is moving into that cloud space, right? And government is saying, hey, look, you know, we don't just jump into stuff, right? We've got to evaluate if this is going to work. How does it affect our security? How does it affect different things, right? That evaluation period, suddenly, it, Microsoft is going to sunset 365, in some cases, as some entities are moving into 365, right? So what are they going to do? Are they going to start the review process all over again? Okay. And then in, and you sit there and say, okay, look, how, how do I deal with this, this shift? How do I deal with this, this, this change? Right? So let's take a look at you know, cloud as an example. Right? You've got Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. Right? Amazon Web Services is, is the Amazon Cloud. Right? So here's a little bit of data coming through. Um, just through the end of, of uh, sort of third quarter last year, right? So Amazon Web Services right now is growing at a rate of, this one was at 78%, I saw other data, it's 87%. So somewhere around 80% per year is Amazon Web Services growth right now, okay? By 2020, the forecast is that they're gonna be doing uh, right around $40 billion worth of web services, right? So I talked about the ear thing, the hearing aid thing, right? People who weren't adapting, people who weren't adapting, right? Um, HP is about to split. Did people know that? HP is going to split into two separate companies. Okay. All right. So these companies, I can tell you right now, there's there's people here who are saying we've got to shift, and whether they can shift fast enough to decrease the amount of bleed that they've got. Right? But the leaders right now are Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. Microsoft, Office 365, Google, right? You got Google Drive. I go online, I don't have to sign up for anything. I've got equivalent to Excel, Word, email, calendar, everything integrated. Do I have to call IT? No. Do I have to call anybody for permission? No. Okay? So the pace, the pace, the pace is coming. All right. So this just gives you a little bit. Salesforce, you know, is really known as that as that sort of the cloud provider. They're half of what uh, what Amazon is doing. And Amazon, by the way, the core business core business does 88 billion a year, right? And so this is a small part. But in that core business, I think in the last, I think eight nine years. Amazon has turned a profit in three quarters until they applied or created Amazon Web Services. That's their cash cow. <laughs> they either break even or lose money on Amazon.com and they make all their money on Amazon Web Services. All right. uh, it's forecasted that by 2018, I think this is the right figure, by 2018, um, Amazon Prime will have as many subscribers as uh, Google, Apple, Netflix, and Hulu combined. Right? That's their push. Right? And their push isn't going into the ether. Who's it going to? Right? I go sit on a bike at the gym and I watch, you know, Netflix when I'm on my you know, working out, okay? The consumption is us, and that begins to drive that cycle a little bit. So now that we've, we've laid out that data, what are those drivers? Why is, you know, where is that, is that kind of change coming from, right? We've got the state change, east to west. Right? I was talking to some people this morning, in North Carolina, they're riffing people all over the place, okay? They're changing the structure of how they're doing business. 
right? It's east to west, it's coming. The migration is coming in terms of those sort of trends, right? The dissatisfaction at the legislative political level for tolerance of projects, platforms, programs is becoming more and more constrained. So what happens, right? So what happens in that process and how do you deal with that transformational component? Because it's not something that you sit there and you get to pick and choose how the transformation is gonna happen for you. It's thrust on you, right? You, you suddenly look down and the basement's flooding and it's like, okay, how do I deal with it? So <clears throat> this is a model, excuse me, that, that I developed about 20 years ago. And what it talks about, um, and I've matured it over time, so it's not static. But the thing is that we talk about time and we talk about what phase you're in. Right? So let's look at this, sort of this initial box. This is kind of maybe where you are initially. As you move, as you go into that next iteration, which is this orange box, okay, there's an overlap between the two. And that overlap is what you keep. Right? People process and technology, this old people process and technology to be able to do your transformational shift, this goes away in some capacity. Either people get retrained, or they get rift, or they get fired in private sector or laid off, okay? The technology gets retired, legacy systems go away, right? And the processes get re-engineered to meet the workflow needs, okay? But what that does is it creates a gap in here. And so now you have not people process and technology, but you have people process data and devices, okay, because technology is now splintering out. And you have this gap. You have this gap in here between what you still retained as being core capability and what that outer edge is in terms of the next transformational iteration of who you are. Okay? There's a gap in here. This is where the risk lives, and that's where that readiness component or how capable or how prepared you are to be able to move into that next state of transformation is. This is where it lives, is in this gap. Because as you phase from here into here, this is what you know, this is what's new, brand new, in developing this. And that's that readiness measurement. That's that thing that, that really affects success versus failure. Does that make sense? It's late in the afternoon, I get it. Okay. So on the decision-making side, um, there's really two root causes in terms of how you're making decisions associated to that transformation process, okay? Um, insufficient motivation and cognitive bias. Right. I was gonna bring up an example that I hadn't brought up yet before I dig, dig into this a little bit. Um, in 2015, J.P. Chase, uh, Chase Bank, right? everybody knows that, uh, made an announcement that they were uh, upping their internet security budget. And did anybody hear about this? Um, they went from $250 million per year $500 million per year just on internet security. Just on internet security. <laughs> okay? Now, to some degree, it's a bit of a marketing move, right? Yeah. It's like, look how safe your, your money is, your identity is, all those things. We're fighting crime, all that good stuff, right? So it, it's good. But at the same time, you're looking at a shift of doubling in proportion. Can you imagine if your budget, starting in January, went from $250 million to $500 million with a performance consequence associated to that? That's, that's heady. <laughs> right? I, mean, that, I mean, think of, you know, there's people who are, like, losing a lot of sleep right now. <laughs> okay? It's that level of movement and that speed. Right? And again, it, it reflects back into that private sector disruption process because if you look at something that Microsoft releases or potentially Google or Oracle, 
uh, EMC or any vendor out there, right? Suddenly their life cycle on that product is 18 to 24 months before they completely restructure that product. Right? So by the time that sometimes a state procurement gets to the point where you're purchasing the product, you're one to two to three iterations behind. And you have to rethink that entire model, right? And you have the political pressure coming in saying, hey, we made better performance. So the transformation process gets to be very complex, right? It gets very daunting. And so people go and they immediately jump to, well, we're just going to do incremental. Well, the data shows that if you do incremental, putting my toe in the water, that tends to have a lower success rate. <laughs> so now you're getting pinched from another direction. Right? And so it's understanding and being able to measure that gap, like I showed in the previous slide, in terms of your readiness, capacity, and capability. Can you actually make that, that leap? Okay? And so what's driving it is, are you making the right decisions in the context of that leap? Are you being able to move in that leap? And so the root causes that have really been found out um, by a study that was uh, you know, really published in uh, Harvard Business uh, Review is insufficient motivation and cognitive bias. Insufficient motivation. What is the average tenure of a millennial in government service? This is the active group participation part. <laughs> Give me a guess. Just throw a number out. Two years. Ten years? Two years? Anybody? There's some millennial kinds over here. I'm too old. I can't differentiate anymore. 2.3 years. Three years. Three years between the time they enter state service or federal service and the time they leave. Not go to another department. They leave. Right? And the reason is because they see the onboarding process as a transaction, not a relationship. And because it's a transaction, it's a disposable entity, it's a disposable thing. It is not a relationship that they have buy-in into what they're doing, okay? And it's just simply a generational issue, right? Again, the data is there, right? So insufficient motivation is that root cause that says in the decision-making process when we onboard millennials, we are not making a conscious effort to adapt our work processes to the way that they've been raised and taught and what their needs are as individuals coming into the workforce, as an example. Because it's a hot, I'm only bringing that up because it's a hot topic, right? It's a thing that's being brought up actively pretty much right now. Okay. Uh, on the cognitive bias side, what that means is that you're going with your gut. My gut's telling me, right, that I gotta go do this. And your gut tells you good things a lot of the time. Right? It's how we make some intuitive decisions, but it's those intuitive bias decisions that are continuing to lead us into some paths that are not generating that value. And so as a result, it's, it's in, what I'm trying to emphasize here is that, and the takeaway really is, is in that measurement of that readiness capacity in that chart that allows you to understand where those vulnerabilities are and how far you're gonna need to leap and can you make that leap and, is it, and what is gonna be involved in that leap and is that leap simply too far, right? is part A, and part B, are you fully committed to the leap? It's a directive, we're burning the ships, it's Cortez, you're, <laughs> you're marching over the mountain, there is no sailing back, we're going, right? And it's that level of commitment that generates that, that, that benefit in terms of the outcome, all right? So that's it, I mean, pretty much, that's the end of the deck. And all I wanted to do was really kind of share some perspectives in the sense that states and that migration are coming, that some of that meant, sort of that mindset is coming this way. The private sector is introducing some of those thought processes. And then as California, you're gonna be impacted by those. So then how do you think about it? How do you think about how far to make that leap, right? So, you know, IPM, you know, sold the cloud to California. That's going through that implementation. That is a transformational process. Right? What's that readiness process look like? How is that going to happen? Right? And really understanding the depth 
of what that's going to take. So I think we've got, what, like five minutes left? I don't know. So what are the solutions? The solution really is taking a look at what I'm offering is that the solution is taking a look at that depth of the leap and then understanding how, the, how you're making a decision to move forward. Right? And so are you doing it? Do you have the proper motivation in that context? Do you have the, the is, are you making behavioral bias decisions because you believe or you think and my experience tells me this? In that context, your experience may be telling you those things and if you were still working in that previous world, yeah, it's accurate, but that transformation has taken you into a new space plus you have the impacts of external influences from other states and private sector. So now that bias is now leading you into a path that may not exactly meet what the need is. And so it's that measurement before you leap. It's that understanding where you're vulnerable before you move. Right? And fixing that or addressing that consciously rather than running into it and saying, we'll just address it as we go. Okay. Yes, sir. What's the adoption rate of that uh, solution you just described? The adoption rate is, is uh, pretty, is, is in a very steep vertical climb right now. And it's mostly driven by leadership rather than by uh, front level folks. And the reason is that, uh, as an example, with the Florida legislature, what both on the House and Senate side, um, they're, they, they are terrified of approving transformational projects because the governor is an anti-technology governor right and pretty much he's really leaving it to when my term's over let the let the other governor deal with it i'm not going to do anything on my watch i asked the wrong i kind of really meant it, the front line because remember the doctor did anything with yeah. leadership but it never occurred right yeah. that's what i want who's are the tricklers getting it? the tricklers are getting it um again mostly at the leadership side from program because the thing that that program folks have really on the private sector side it's mostly the chief financial officer who's driving this um, in in private sector 60 65 percent of all technology reports to the CFO technology is not at the table driving strategy anymore it is not part of the strategic discussion anymore it is a function of maintaining systems so the CFOs are now driving that based on business need. Because again, let's go back, right? So as scary as that statement is, and it's not meant to offend, take a step back for a moment, right? Let's talk about your, your, your iPhone again. Do you need IT to do the update to your cell phone? No. Do you need IT to hook you up to the cloud to back up your data? No. Do you need IT to teach you how to use Candy Crush? No. Right? So the challenge is that business is now driving more in the private sector of those elements. And that driving influence is beginning to influence best practices and trends within the context of where government is going and what the expectation of constituents are on the legislature, the people that they elected. And the legislators, you know, I don't know how many people deal with legislators, but they're not like the most tech savvy people. They're just, they're trying to deal with, you know, fundamentals, you know, is the water clean, you know, are people being taken care of, that kind of thing. So there's that blend, but it's measuring that gap in transformation. And so leaders within program are saying, look, I'm getting directives to do this. I need to know where the landmines are. And that's where they're really adopting it, right? in the sense that you're not going to have a manager who's a, a PMO manager or a program manager come in and say, we're going to do a readiness measurement just to see what the gap is. Right, because they're getting the pressure to deliver. The person who's driving that is the deputy director or the director saying, I want to know where the hole is because I don't want to have to be sitting in front of the ledge nine months from now having to explain why and why not. Right? I want to know where the gap is so that we don't just stumble into it anymore. Because the consequence is too high. The forgiveness pattern is gone, right? Because why? 
because I get 15 updates to my operating system on my phone in three months. <laughs> And it's that, it's that it, you know, it's like, it, you know, it's sort of like that mathematical thing, right? You know, private sector's on a sign, government's on a cosine. So, you know, you have that invert, in, you know, sort of inverse kind of model going on, or if anybody remembers that. But, you know, it, 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 it's, con it's counter, right? And it's not like you can turn on a dime. So it's how do you bridge that gap, and how do you take those transformational steps, and the fact that you measure that gap, understand the vulnerability, then move to be able to be very transparent about where those vulnerabilities are, right? But then don't rely on the biases that you have or the lack of commitment that you have in that, in that level. Does that help kind of answer the question? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? It didn't put anybody asleep, so I guess that's a good sign. <laughs> Was this helpful at all? Was some good data at all? I think it's cocktail hour, I think, somewhere. <laughs> right? Okay, good. All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>